I'm Robin Tui, Vice President Support Groups of the International Myeloma Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's teleconference to learn more about current trends in myeloma and research with this update from three major medical meetings held in May and June of 2019. Dr. Brian Dury will explain what's new and exciting from the American Society of Clinical Oncology, ASCO, the European Hematology Association meetings, and the IMF's International Myeloma Working Group Summit. We thank our sponsors for supporting this educational program, Celgene and Takeda Oncology. If you've not yet had time to access tonight's slides, you can do so at myeloma.org. The slides are available to download so that you can print them out and save them and take notes on them. While Dr. Dury is presenting tonight, each of you will have control of and can advance the slides. Dr. Dury will let you know when to click and advance to the next page. All slides are numbered for your reference. At the end of tonight's presentation, we will open the lines for your questions. And now it's my pleasure to turn this call over to Dr. Dury to begin this informative teleconference. Dr. Dury? Well, thank you so much, uh, Robin, for that very uh, uh, kind introduction. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity tonight to review these exciting uh, new developments at those three meetings. And so, uh, as uh, Robin has indicated, uh, I'm the chairman of the IMF, and I also chair the IMWG meeting, which was the meeting which just occurred in, uh, in Amsterdam. We can go uh, immediately to slide number three, where I give an overview of what we will uh, cover tonight. So if you go to slide number three, recent abstracts, presentations, and publications, uh, the big focus will be on what were the new presentations at ASCO. As you'll see on slide three at ASCO, there were 210 uh, myeloma-related abstracts this year, of which eight were oral presentations, and I will touch on uh, many of the topics from those oral presentations. At the EHA meeting in Amsterdam, which followed right afterwards in early June, uh, there were a similar number, actually, 199 myeloma-related uh, abstracts, of which there were 13 oral presentations. Uh, it was exciting to see that one of the um, presidential symposium abstracts this year was a myeloma uh, abstract, which was the abstract concerning the Cassiopeia trial, uh, which is daratumumab, valcade, thalidomide, and dexamethasone, and that's one of the trials that I will touch on in more detail. And interestingly enough, um, a number of these abstracts have also been published simultaneously, which is kind of a new trend which is happening where uh, top abstracts are also published in full form almost at the same time. If we go to the next slide, uh, I'm going to cover uh, five different topics uh, for tonight. Smoldering myeloma, frontline therapy, uh, maintenance, relapse therapies, and of course, uh, as always, the, the new and exciting agents uh, coming along in development. If we go to slide number five, I'm going to talk first of all about smoldering multiple myeloma, SMM, and the two top abstracts at ASCO, abstracts number 8000 and 8001, uh, dealt with smoldering myeloma. The first one uh, dealt with the uh, risk classification system, and the second one with uh, uh, treatment. And so uh, I'd like to focus first of all on what is a smoldering myeloma, and uh, in, in slide number six, uh, I try to clarify for you the transition from the early stage of monoclonal gammopathies, which is monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance, MGUS, through smoldering multiple myeloma into active myeloma. And during this process, as I highlight there, the monoclonal protein is increasing, as you can see with the red circle. At the same time, uh, there's an increase in other things related to myeloma, particularly the plasma cell percentage in the bone marrow, 
what we call BMPC, bone marrow percentage plasma cells. And of course, ultimately, what we want to avoid are the crab features where there could be kidney damage or uh, anemia or bone issues. And so there has been a, an increasing focus on early diagnosis before uh, critical uh, damage occurs. And so the first thing that happened, if we go to the next slide, is that we started to look at what are the uh, predictors of progression. And so uh, on slide number uh, seven, which is the next uh, slide, the International Myeloma Working Group, which is the, the meeting which just occurred in uh, Amsterdam uh, uh, at the meeting last year, um, we talked about, well, uh, how should we uh, evaluate patients who are uh, having smoldering myeloma and uh, at risk for progression. And so we uh, identified the endpoint of progression at two years. And so then we asked the question, what are the parameters that allow us to predict if a patient with smoldering myeloma will progress to active myeloma within the first two years? And so we gathered together over 2,000 patients and asked that question. And the first thing that we uh, learned was that uh, using a very simple model, what we call the 2 2020 model, which is highlighted on the left of slide number seven, this turned out to be uh, a very reliable indicator of progression at two years. And so 20 is the free light ratio, two is the myeloma protein level, and 20 is the bone marrow plasma cell percentage. And so this is, this is very simple. However, um, for individual patients, uh, often the numbers could be slightly higher or lower than those kind of cutoffs. And so we used a new um, logistic regression model, a, a special statistical method to come up with a more sophisticated uh, scoring system, which is listed on the right-hand side. And you can see that using that, we can come up with some different levels of breakpoints for those uh, same factors to indicate if a patient is in a very low risk of developing active myeloma or in a higher risk. And you can see I've marked in green the low levels of free light and um, particularly bone marrow plasma cells that indicate that the myeloma is not likely to progress. And then on the opposite side, if the bone marrow uh, plasma cells are increasing, that can be a strong indicate, indicator of progression, as uh, is the case with an increased level of the free, free light ratio. And so if we go to the next slide, slide number eight, you can see how these factors line up as compared to what we call the myeloma defining events, which are the uh, events that we use to classify a patient as myeloma before the crab features emerge. And you can see that for the high-risk smoldering, the levels of the bone marrow plasma cells, the free light ratio, the serum spike, and the other factors are just a little bit lower than the myeloma-defining events. And so basically what we're doing is we're taking these same or similar factors to assess if they're at a slightly lower level, does that indicate also that myeloma is highly likely? And so if we go to the next slide, slide number nine, you can see that uh, indeed that is the case. And so if we look at patients who have a higher score, mostly based on a higher plasma cell percentage, higher free, free light ratio, and higher levels of the monoclonal protein in the serum, you can see in red that by the time uh, of two years, there's between a 72 to 80% uh, chance of myeloma developing in patients with the higher score. But equally important, I want to emphasize on slide number nine, is that the low-risk patients are not getting myeloma. At two years, even all the way out to five years, there's a very low risk of those low-risk patients getting myeloma. And so this is extremely important to exclude those patients uh, because these patients clearly are not patients we would want uh, to give uh, active treatment. And so... If we go to the next slide, this summarizes what was uh, the second abstract at ASCO, uh, ASCO abstract 8001, and this was presented by Dr. Sagaronio, and this was the result of a randomized phase three trial in which there were 182 patients in the trial, 
half of the patients got lenalidomide, which is obviously Revlimid, at a 25 milligram dose ongoing, uh, three weeks on, one week off, or they were just closely observed. And so uh, to, to summarize this very briefly on the next slide, slide number 11, that you can see using some older criteria, which they, they used the older criteria. This was before we had the new criteria. They used some older male criteria. They classified the patients into high, intermediate, intermediate or lower risk patients. And so what turned out to be the case was that patients taking the Revlimid <clears throat> had a significantly lower risk <clears throat> of progression. However, in the intermediate and lower risk patients, um, the, there was no uh, statistical uh, benefit. And so this is a very, very important point. Uh, it's also interesting that actually in this trial, uh, uh, unfortunately only a, a small fraction of the patients were truly high risk by these criteria and our new criteria. And actually only uh, 29 out of the patients fell into that group, uh, of which you know half, which was 14, got the got the Revlimid. So, so actually, although this was a fairly large study of 182 patients, only a small fraction fell into this very important group where we want to have the the most information. Now, if we go to uh, what is a completely opposite approach, which is the the, the, the approach that we are using in the Black, Black Swan Research Initiative. On slide number 12, I give you the results from the CSER trial, the, 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 the um, Spanish trial, GEM, the Spanish uh, CSER trial for high-risk smoldering. And this falls into a similar classification. These are patients who truly do have high-risk smoldering myeloma, and in this case, the patients are treated with therapy in a curative intent. And so these patients received a combination of Kyprolis, Revlimid, and dexamethasone, plus autologous stem cell transplant. So really quite the opposite approach to taking just Revlimid as a single agent. And so Dr. Mary V. Mateos from Spain uh, uh, provided an update at the EHA meeting and this was uh, approximately a three-year update right now, a uh, little, little beyond uh, 30 months. And as you can see on this slide number 12, overall survival 98% and 94% uh, of the patients are still in remission. And I can tell you that um, over 60% of the patients uh, are MRD undetected or negative at the 10th of the minus 6, which is less than the 1 in a million level. And that actually, that number is actually increasing as the patients move forward from consolidation through to complete maintenance. And uh, I think that that number might reach as high as 70% ultimately MRD undetected uh, with this therapy. And so uh, this trial is similar to an ongoing U.S. trial, which is called the ASCENT trial, uh, which is KRD uh, with daratumumab added. And so we are uh, anticipating that this ongoing trial across the country will have uh, even better results in terms of achieving uh, MRD negative and uh, long-term uh, survival benefit. And so for smoldering myeloma, uh, if we go to slide number 13, the next slide right now, I think it's uh, a very uh, important time to think carefully and review carefully what are the treatment strategies for uh, smoldering myeloma. And so I think that uh, what I would draw attention to is that we need to be uh, aware that, yes, Revlimid as a single agent may be able to be used as a preventative to delay progression. However, it's not really a definitive treatment for myeloma. And uh, I, I personally do have some concerns just using a single agent that there, there could be emergence of resistance. And obviously for a patient who has no symptoms, uh, there is this ongoing need for therapy. And actually in the ECOG trial, uh, over half the patients, well, 51%, uh, ended up discontinue, discontinuing the treatment because of some side effects. Uh, also, since it's not a specific indication right now, uh, uh, there could be questions about reimbursement. Uh, 
And uh, as I mentioned in my last bullet, uh, we know already and was reported at ASCO there is already some increased risk of secondary malignancies with that approach. And so on slide number 14, I just show you what is the current, what we call algorithm, when should treatment be initiated? And so what is clear in blue on the left of slide number 14 is that if you have crab features or myeloma-defining events, which is the plasma cells uh, 60%, the, the free light ratio at 100 or higher, and at least one, or uh, sorry, at least two MRI lesions, so more than one, at least two MRI focal lesions, then treat as myeloma. If it's less than that, then uh, one needs to discuss this carefully. Uh, a clinical trial, I think, is a very good idea right now. Uh, and uh, just to, to, until we can assess what really is the optimal strategy for, for these patients. But I'll be happy to take uh, whatever questions you, you might have related to, to these uh, current options. So if we move forward to my second uh, topic, which is the frontline uh, therapy, uh, as I put on slide number 15, the key question is, uh, can we improve on the VRD triplet? Right now, the standard of care for a newly diagnosed patient is the combination of Velcade, Revlimid, and DEX, a triplet therapy. And now, with updates at ASCO and E. EHA, and then with discussion at our IMWG summit in Amsterdam, there is interest in uh, particularly three new trial uh, data sets which can impact the decision. And so as far as looking at triplets, uh, two key options are to substitute the Velcade with Kyprolis or with Daratumumab. And those are the Forte trial and the Maya trial. And uh, just by coincidence, uh, just earlier this afternoon, the results of the Maya, Maya trial, which uh, was uh, daratumumab, revlimid index versus revlimid index, so a triplet versus a doublet, this was actually just today approved um, by the FDA as a frontline uh, treatment option. Uh, so in in the uh, non-transplant setting, actually, but um, uh, approved in the frontline setting. So this was uh, very good news. The other combination that I'll talk about a little bit is the combination of daratumumab combined with VTD, uh, Velcade thalidomide dex, which is a combination frequently used in Europe uh, where the VRD is not, uh, or until recently was not available, actually VRD uh, was just recently approved in Europe based upon the SWOG777 uh, results. So if we go forward, just to give you a little idea of what is the impact of some of those therapies, uh, the, the Cassiopeia trial, which is DARA, Velcate, Lidomide, Dex versus the, the VTD, so what is the impact of the daratumumab? I highlight here uh, that on the left you have the DARA combination, and so uh, a higher number of patients achieving deep responses, and this translates, as I summarize at the bottom, 33.7% uh, MRD negative versus 19%, so much deeper responses with the four-drug combination versus the triplet. If we go to the next slide, this translates into uh, longer remissions, longer progression-free survival, 92.7% versus 84.6% on the left there. And then uh, this is uh, on the right showing the impact of achieving the deeper responses, stringent CR, which is similar to an MRD negative. As we have seen in other trials, it is interesting that if the VTD without the DARA works well for a particular patient, and, and achieves a stringent CR, this is uh, obviously better than not achieving a, a stringent CR. So in some cases, a triplet can have a, a good impact. If we go to the next slide, it just summarizes what was updated uh, recently at ASCO for the Maya trial. And this just shows you that for uh, patients under the age of 75 or over the age of 75 on the right, that the DARA 
Revlimid and Dex is superior to the two-drug doublet in terms of the remission duration, which is the progression-free survival. So very, very uh, promising results. And uh, you can see there that uh, it's indicated that the median is not reached, and so that we don't know what the average length of the remission is going to be. And it could be quite long. Uh, one particular advantage to the DARA is that patients can continue to take it. Uh, a problem with the uh, VRD regimen is that the VRD is used for induction, uh, but it's difficult to use that for ongoing ma maintenance because of the problem with uh, neuropathy. If we go to the next slide, it just kind of puts into perspective these remission durations that we've seen in recent years with the different combinations. And you can see over to the right, uh, the combinations that are producing the best results are the VRD uh, triplet as well as the DRD triplet with the Maya trial. And so in the frontline setting, as far as triplets go, uh, we really have that option now to consider VRD or uh, DRD with the uh, length of the uh, remission uh, heading towards the four-year level, which is really uh, remarkably good for a first remission. Uh, the next slide, number 20, uh, shows you uh, what can be achieved with KRD in the frontline setting. And this was an interesting study because it compared KRD without transplant for 12 months versus uh, introducing uh, uh, transplant. And so uh, what happened was that the results were almost equivalent in terms of achieving uh, deep responses. And so uh, this, this raised the question that if you have uh, KRD giving very good deep responses and you continue it for 12 months, it may be that this uh, means that those patients do not need to have a transplant. But I think that most uh, investigators that I've talked to are, are still thinking that we need more uh, data before we would reach that conclusion. But, but clearly, uh, continuing with the KRD uh, for longer than the traditional you know, four or six months, months induction could well have this type of an added uh, benefit. And so if we go to the next slide 21, it shows you where we have in the algorithm uh, these different options slotted in. And so in the non-transplant setting, uh, you can have a VRD or DRD until progression. Uh, you can see in that blue box with the yellow writing and over on the right for the transplant, patients, again, you can have VRD, but in this case, uh, perhaps the, the DARA as a quadruplet. In the U.S., we might prefer DARA with VRD versus VTD, and there are early data to indicate that that will, in fact, be an excellent uh, therapy. So moving to slide 22, what about maintenance? Well, there was a little bit of data, new helpful data at the EHA meeting with exazomib, which is the oral version of uh, a proteasome inhibitor like Velcade or Kyprolis, Exazomib, uh, very, very uh, effective uh, by mouth uh, agent. And so on slide number 23, I show you results uh, from the German study group presented at the EHA indicating that patients receiving Exazomib maintenance had deepening of their uh, response uh, with the exazomib maintenance. So this very much supports the use of exazomib in the maintenance setting, uh, although we're all waiting for some ongoing trials because uh, perhaps uh, using exazomib plus revlimid, for example, could be the ideal uh, maintenance, but we're still waiting to, to have data on that. But in the meantime, it's quite uh, reassuring to have this uh, extra data showing that there is an impact in terms of deepening response with ongoing maintenance. So moving into the, 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 the next area um, is, is the relapse therapies, and then we'll finish up with the new therapies. But in the relapse therapies, uh, uh, quite a bit of new data uh, with different new agents, and I'll just go through those uh, a slide at a time. Uh, and so if we go to slide number um, 25, uh, the, the, the first uh, data that have now been published, actually published in the New England Journal, show that 
elotuzumab, which was approved in combination with uh, Revlimid and Dex, is now uh, very effective in the combination with pomalidomide and Dex. And so this very nice study, uh, which was uh, published in New England Journal with Dr. Demopoulos as the first author, shows that added benefit with elotuzumab as a triplet versus um, pomalidomide and Dex. So the triplet here, uh, better than the doublet again, and if we go to the next slide, uh, and this was presented at ASCO this year by Dr. Paul Richardson, is a tuximab, pomalidomide and dex versus pomalidomide and dex. What you can see here is that in this relapse setting, particularly for Revlimid refractory patients, then pomalidomide dex is kind of the standard, and we add to that to have a triplet that might be more effective. And you can see here, is a tuximab, which is a monoclonal antibody, very similar to daratumumab, so anti-CD38, similar to daratumumab, the combination of three drugs versus two drugs showing a similar uh, type of benefit. And the average length of the remission is uh, a little bit less than a year in those trials, 11.8 months or so. And then the next slide, uh, slide 27, shows another uh, combination, in this case, daratumumab combined with carfilzomib and dex, and this is a, a very uh, exciting combination with very uh, high response rates in patients who are both refractory uh, to lenalidomide as well as exposed but not refractory. And so, uh, deep responses at VGPR are better in around 70% of patients. So another triplet which is showing strong activity in the relapse setting. And an interesting point about the corfilzomib used in that regimen, if we go to slide number 28, is that it does seem that it can be used once weekly, even in frail patients. And so this was uh, presented uh, coming out of uh, three different studies, actually, uh, that corfilzomib on a once-a-week basis is well-tolerated even in frail patients with uh, equivalent uh, benefit and uh, well tolerated in terms of different side effects. And so this is very good news because obviously once a week is much easier to use uh, for patients uh, versus the standard uh, twice weekly uh, regimen. So very, very good news there. And obviously uh, separately, uh, there are data uh, published indicating that um, Daratumumab uh, by sub-Q in injection has equivalent uh, benefit versus the IV, and so it's it's going to be uh, good to, to to have a combination where the um, the daratumumab, carfilzomib, and dex, the uh, daratumumab could actually be given uh, sub-Q, and the carfilzomib could be given uh, once a week. Okay, so moving to the, the next slide, number 29, I just summarize uh, the first relapse options now, and you can see breaking it down by uh, refractory to lenalidomide or not. You can see those options with uh, Revlimid and Dex, uh, Kyprolis, ex, uh, Exazimib, or um, uh, Elotuzumab, and then for patients refractory uh, to lenalidomide, uh, the top options are uh, daratumumab, uh, Velke dex, or daratumumab, uh, pomalidomide dex. Obviously, uh, also for patients who are not refractory, uh, daratumumab, revlimid, and dex, uh, basically the Maya regimen is, is, is an excellent option. And so alternatives in the refractory setting are some of these combinations that I mentioned, uh, the elotuzumab, the kyprolis, uh, exazomib, uh, isotuximab, uh, and just pomalidomide dex if, if that is what might be uh, feasible. So going to slide number 30, so how do we uh, uh, select and sequence these different new drugs? Uh, a lot of different options, and so uh, it's, it's becoming more difficult, but I want to highlight uh, some of these uh, uh, newer drugs, which may be options to be discussed with your doctor. And so if we look at slide number 31 now, active drugs in multiple myeloma, you can see over the, on the right 
I've indicated what are some of these uh, newer and future drugs that could be options uh, following on from uh, relapse uh, therapy. And I've highlighted in red over on the right uh, three um, uh, agents, uh, the GSK, the AMG420, and CAR T cells, as well as some of the other things that we have talked about and I'll touch on a little bit more. And so I want to finish up by talking a little bit about, uh, in addition to the recently approved drugs, uh, such as exazomib, daratumumab, and elotuzumab, what are these next level of drugs uh, which will really uh, start to have an impact and how will they contribute to uh, better outcomes? And so if we go to the next slide, I summarize the, 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 the new agents that I'm going to touch on, the GSK molecule, the AMG420, CAR T cells, and then three newer agents, uh, the cell mod agents uh, similar to IMIDS, Selenexor, and Venetoclax. So if we uh, talk about the, the GSK uh, molecule first, this is um, uh, a very uh, interesting molecule which is uh, actually frequently not discussed a lot, but I think is a, a particularly uh, important uh, antibody that was presented at ASH and has been uh, published actually and then recently updated uh, the results of this DREAM uh, trial, DREAM 1, Phases 2 and Part 2, which I summarize on slide 33. And so first of all, the GSK is a monoclonal antibody against BCMA, B-cell uh, maturation antigen. And so this is a very popular target these days. But in this case, uh, the monoclonal antibody is combined with a drug which is internalized into the myeloma cell and uh, helps to destroy the myeloma. And so it's a monoclonal antibody drug conjugate. So it's a combo, and so it's unique in that way. But it is what's called off the shelf, so it's, an, it's a treatment that you can give. It's a fully humanized monoclonal antibody, so it can be given every three weeks, which is what it is done in the DREAM trial and there's a standardized dose now, 3.4 milligrams per kilogram, and with this, there's a 60% overall response rate in, in patients with relapsed refractory myeloma, and so this is obviously a very good uh, result and uh, well-tolerated with uh, a good remission length on average around about a year. There is a peculiar side effect, which is an eye irritation, which... Uh, it does need some uh, management with eye drops, but does seem to be uh, reversible. But apart from that, is really remarkably uh, well uh, tolerated. And so this is an important new uh, monoclonal antibody, which is on a fast track for approval by the FDA and also is in what's called a prime uh, project in, in the EMA in Europe and, and is headed towards approval on uh, both sides of the Atlantic. If we go to the next slide, slide number 34, uh, this is just giving uh, an update of the AMG420, which is also a monoclonal antibody against BCMA, but it, in this case, it's bispecific, uh, which means that uh, the antibody binds to BCMA, but it also engages T cells, and so that's the bite part of it. It's a T cell engager, and uh, so this brings the myeloma together with the T cells, in, in this case, in an effort to improve the killing of the myeloma cell. And these data have been updated a number of times. On this particular chart here, you can see the different doses have been tested. 400 micrograms is the dose that seems to be uh, tolerated uh, okay and uh, is producing some deep responses, which you can see with the stars and the red circles and also the blue circles with the squares. These are CRs and MRD negative. Uh, the two things to be aware of with this particular AMG Amgen 420 byte is that there is a type of neuropathy that has been occurring as a side effect, and this is something that we need to understand a little bit better in terms of how reversible is that and how frequent is that? And then the other thing 
uh, about the uh, Amgen 420, uh, which I discuss on the next slide, if we go to slide number 35, is that there is a first generation and then uh, uh, a second or next generation of these uh, bytes. And so the 420 is the first generation, and this uh, is uh, a, a type of antibody which has a what's called a very short uh, half-life in the blood, which means that it has to be given by continuous infusion for 24 hours uh, for uh, for 28 days, actually. So this does not make it the most convenient therapy in the world. And so, as you might imagine, Amgen is looking at new options for that using a weekly infusion with a new antibody called the 701, which is just coming into trials now. And so we'll see how well is the 420 working and then what might be uh, coming along with the newer uh, 701 molecule. And then to, to finish up uh, in the uh, treatments against uh, the BCMA on slide number 36, I summarize the update with the CAR T cell therapy with the BB2121. And again, uh, excellent results with the um, uh, um, selected dose in the middle there, uh, beyond the low dose, uh, with a high response rate and also uh, pretty good remissions in the relapse refractory uh, setting. And so uh, on the next slide, number 37, I summarize, well, how do these different therapies, which are all attacking the myeloma through this BCMA, which is the target on the surface of the myeloma, how do those different therapies stack up? Uh, and so uh, we've got an elephant sitting on the on the BCMA car there trying to drive it forward. Is, is the car the approach with the elephant? Or maybe is the GSK uh, equally good? Or maybe the bispecific will turn out to be even uh, better? Um, I summarize on the left there, the lengths of the remissions are somewhat similar, right around a year, 12 months, 11.8, and then it looks like maybe somewhat similar with the AMG 420. Uh, overall response rates, uh, perhaps a little bit higher with the CAR-T, but really pretty respectable with the other agents as well. And so we need to look at which one to give first, which one is going to be a whole lot easier or less expensive, and maybe they would work even better if we could give them earlier in the disease. And so uh, just to finish up on the last few slides here, slide number 38, this is uh, summarizing a new IMID type of molecule, which is called a cell mod. It's called, uh, uh, well, Iberdomid, it's CC220. And uh, the high point in this early study of 51 patients is that there was a 31% uh, response rate in patients who had previously received um, uh, IMIDs such as revlimid or pomalidomide. And so uh, it's encouraging that this type of a cell mod could be a next generation of a type of IMID therapy. And then on the next slide, we had new data on cell Nexor. In this uh, case, combined with uh, daratumumab, uh, very high response rate in patients uh, with uh, relapsing refractory disease, high response rate, 77% in patients um, uh, with uh, relapse, uh, relapse disease. And so, uh, as we've discussed elsewhere, the Selenexor is currently being reviewed uh, by the FDA, and it seems likely that it, it can possibly get a thumbs up of approval from the FDA as a new approved uh, agent. And so just to finish up on something that has been in the news, uh, and that is uh, the uh, venetoclax. Uh, so uh, venetoclax is an oh. agent uh, which is an anti-BCL2 therapy. BCL2 is, uh, is something that um, uh, prevents uh, myeloma cells from dying, and so if you block BCL2, then cells uh, will be much more responsive to treatment. Uh, there was a problem, however, because the trial, the main trial with venetoclax, the Bellini trial, had a number of deaths. In fact, in, the, in this large trial, there were 41 patients who actually died in this trial, and 13 uh, were linked to therapy. Uh, this was associated with infection and, in some cases, with progression of the myeloma. And so because of this, uh, the FDA actually put a hold on 
venetoclax trials in myeloma. Uh, the good news is that uh, th this hold has just been uh, released by the FDA, and that's because at the EHA, an update on the Bellini trial was presented by Dr. Shaji Kumar, and he showed that there is both a, a remission, a PFS, and an overall survival benefit in patients who have the 1114 translocation. And that, uh, so the additional deaths were, were not occurring so much in those patients. They were occurring in patients in the trial who did not have the 1114 translocation. So this trial had patients with and without the, the special 1140 translocation. And so what the FDA has decided to do is to limit the ongoing trials to patients who do have the translocation 1114, uh, which are patients who do have high levels of BCL2 in the myeloma cell. And so the FDA has reopened a trial called the CANOVA trial in which venetoclax dex will be compared with pomalidomide dex. So this is really good news that beneath the plaques will hopefully get back on track and, and can potentially be uh, end up getting approval as a targeted therapy, uh, possibly the first really effective targeted therapy against a subset of myelomas, in this case, the T1114 patient population. And so in closing, I'll just raise some, some questions about these new therapies on slide number 41. So what is the current perspective? You know, what are the top priorities? which are the most promising, and I think what ends up being most important is that although we always want to have new drugs available in the relapse setting, we're looking for uh, new agents that can make an impact earlier in the disease, such as daratumumab, which has moved already up into the frontline setting. So we're always looking to see which of the new agents might be uh, effective and potent enough and well tolerated enough to be used earlier in the disease. And so we're looking at these anti-BCMA therapies in particular to see which of those might be uh, well tolerated and even more effective if used earlier in the disease course. And so these are exciting times uh, moving forward. A lot of very, very good uh, uh, and important results presented in these last few months with with excellent discussions at our IMWG Summit in Amsterdam, trying to put together some of these recommendations that I've shown you with these different algorithms as how to manage the disease in the different disease settings. And so I'll close again by thanking our sponsors, Celgene and Takeda, and uh, open it up uh, for uh, questions uh, that uh, you, the listeners, might have. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Dury. That that, like you said, it, it's such an exciting time. Whether you're smoldering, frontline, or relapse, and and all of the information you just provided is going to be so helpful to all our patients and caregivers. So I'd like to open up our lines for questions. Our first question comes from the line of Jock Ayello. Your line is open. So, Dr. Dury, thanks so much. Thanks so much for the presentation. Um, it used to be, a couple of years ago, let's say, that it was really, really difficult to get into a CAR-T trial. But these days, there are quite, quite a few CAR-T trials. One of the CAR-T trials. Right. And it was qualified for more than one. Can you give some advice to the patient as to maybe what should they look for in terms of assessing one trial versus the other, or should, should they just pick something most convenient for them? Right. Uh, so uh, this is a very important uh, point, uh, Jack. Uh, so th the good news is that there are a, a number of uh, CAR-T trials uh, open or opening right now, so that there are quite a few uh, options, uh, which, which, which is uh, good. Um, however, um, the intrinsic problem with the CAR-Ts are that um, it takes time uh, for the engineering uh, you know, to, to develop the CAR-Ts to give back to the patient, and uh, in some cases, um, uh, it, it, the, the, the whole the thing doesn't work. And so the first thing I recommend is to go to a center where there are backup options available. So, for example, the GSK uh, monoclonal antibody is an off-the-shelf uh, agent, and so it's quite good if... Um, 
if if the CAR T is uh, not working, then uh, or excuse me, if the CAR T uh, uh, is is delayed and and the patient is progressing while they're waiting to get the CAR T's, then the GSK would be available as a as a backup option. Uh, now. Uh, right now, it's hard to say, and I, I was comparing them to know which of the of the BCMA uh, products are going to be the most effective with that same target. Um, and uh, it's 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 just uh, it's just too uh, soon to know. I, I think that yeah. for some of the there are a number of very new CAR Ts against different targets, and I think that I would be definitely more uh, cautious about those. And so. Uh, I would I would be looking at CAR T against BCMA, or uh, for the time being the GSK or or the bites the BCMA bites the 420 or the 701 which is coming online. But I think that right now it is helpful to go to a center where there are um, these different options available, uh, which you can discuss with the treating doctor about what might be most suitable in, in a particular case. Thanks so much. Okay. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Fern Shilero. Mr. Shilero, your line is open. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Dury. I appreciate all of your um, knowledge and uh, help. When do you uh, think daratumumab will get approved in the sub-Q uh, form? What's realistic? Uh, well, I would think relatively soon, uh, possibly before the end of the year. Um, uh, the Janssen Company are having a pretty good track record. As I said, they got Daratumumab Revdex approved today by the FDA, and so I can assure you that they are pushing very hard. Um, the trial, which shows the equivalence of the sub-Q versus the IV, is, you know, uh, ready for FDA review, and so uh, I think we're all kind of expecting that with, with some sort of a rapid uh, review, it could be uh, certainly within six months, uh, maybe, you know, as soon as the fall, but um, uh, with the FDA, I guess you never know, but um, I think we're all expecting it to be relatively soon. I, I, I realize that um, for most patients, it couldn't be soon enough, you know, that right, right. you would like to start tomorrow. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Thank you. The next question comes from the line of Freeman Sikora. Your line is open. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Dury. I'm uh, very thankful that you have these web conferences. They're very useful for both my current and future treatments. Part of my question, actually my question was just answered by the sub-Q. I had a question about that. But um, so I don't need to ask that question, but I just will say for folks who are listening, I've been on the DARA treatment for a year now. Yes. I saw my oncologist for a second office visit yesterday, and my results have been very significant. My IG levels, IgG levels are now back within the range, and I've had a significant decrease in M-spike 1. So if any patients are wondering about getting DARA as I was a year ago, um, when I heard about it on some of these web conferences, it has worked very well for me. And I'm uh, thankful I listened to the web conferences and was aware of it when I saw my oncologist a year ago and needed to change my protocol. Thank you very much. Well, well, very good. Yeah, well, that's glad to have that report. I think that we've all been very encouraged that the daratumumab by itself and, and also in some of these combinations that I mentioned, uh, the daratumumab Revdex, pomalidomide Dex, and Velky Dex, these are all... Uh, very active combinations, and so I think that we're all uh, thrilled that those are such um, uh, helpful additions for so many patients, and the sub-Q will make a difference. So uh, I know there's an anxiety to get that through and approved as soon as possible. Yeah, I just oh, should, should say I'm on that DARA, POM, and DEX combination, not just the DARA alone, but it has been very successful for me. Thank okay, you. well, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Steph Stephanie Diamond. Your line is open. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Dury. Um, my question also uh, centers around uh, uh, daratumumab. I'm recently diagnosed, just finished my first cycle of RVD. And the question of transplant versus non-transplant, especially if I look at your slide number 21 talking about frontline therapies, still seems to me to lean go to the transplant 
and then continue on a triplicate or, or add the DARA. Is am I reading this slide correctly? Do we do we still go to the transplant first, or do we continue on the uh, medications right. longer? Right. Well, I think that um, the 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 kind of standard recommendation is still to to consider uh, the the transplant after what we call induction. Uh, but we are trending towards uh, giving the induction for a little bit longer to try to maximize that benefit because what we've learned is that if you have an excellent response uh, with the combination, uh, mm -hmm. then those, those are patients who might have a, a stringent CR or even an MRD negative, and, and so those are patients where we could consider not doing the transplant. And so there's a tendency right now to see how much mileage we can get with a combination, especially uh, one of those uh, combinations adding in DARA as a consolidation or something like that, and then um, maybe not uh, doing the transplant. But but the, these are evolving data, you know, where we're, we're still a little bit hesitant to not have uh, transplant as as one of the important options, you know. Right, because my and my understanding is, prim there was a there was some study at uh, MGH not not too long ago that sort of referenced the response to delay delaying the transplant. You were still achieving the same outcomes, except that symptomatically, I think the patients were doing better when they went through the transplant first. But and also you have to look at the. Uh, mutations that an individual patient might have as well, correct? Right, exactly. So I think that there's still this tendency to use the transplant early to get that maximum uh, benefit. And the other thing is that obviously if you take a VRD or a DRD or any one of those combinations plus the transplant, then there are more patients that are having the deeper response. And so that you end up with uh, a benefit for more patients with the transplant. Uh, uh, although some patients could do uh, okay without the transplant, so might do, right, might do as well. Yeah, yeah it's a transitional <laughs> time right now where uh, you know you've got one question, you'll get twenty different answers. You know. <laughs> yes, I, ab absolutely, and also with you know DARA changing from an infusion potentially to a sub Q injection, that may also change what the standard of care then becomes, just in terms of uh, patient um, tolerance. Absolutely, and so that there are a number of different standard of care options that are happening, and so we have uh, VRD as a standard of care, but perhaps DRD, uh, which could be well tolerated, and as I said, you can continue with the DARA, could be uh, a more effective ongoing option, and so we're seeing these changes happening rather quickly in these last uh, um, years and months. Are we also seeing changes then in the maintenance therapy? Someone might start on a VRD but switch to a DRD or something like that. Yes, I think that the, the, the changes in the maintenance are more difficult because it's, it takes a lot longer to show the added value or the, the you know the benefit. Ah, uh, the response, right? Because you've got your minimum load, right? Okay. It's a longer to, to make those changes. Yeah. So let's uh, I understand. Go ahead. We'll try to get one or two. Thank you so questions. very much, sir. No Thank worries. you. Let's try to have one or two more questions before we finish here. The next question comes from the line of Paul Zock. Your line is open. All right. Good evening. Uh, thanks for another excellent presentation. I appreciate it. My, my question is, I had a stem cell transplant in 2017. I'm doing fairly well right now. I'm on maintenance therapy in remission. And right now I'm just taking Remolid, uh, 10 milligrams. Okay. Um, Excellent. And I take still matter once a month. Should I be doing something else, or I know so, there's so many new drugs out there and new therapies that. No, no, I use the Maxim. Uh, uh, if it's working well, uh, you don't need to fix it, you know. Right. <laughs> uh, just just I keep think up on it. You're 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 on a, a, a good approach, and if you're in remission and uh, you're managing well with that Revlimid, um, I think that's good. Uh, the only question would be, would, did you have um, chromosome fish testing at the beginning? Yes, I did. I'm, and did actually, that, I'm a high risk because I'm a, I forget what it was. It was one of the okay. high risk ones. Well, the only thing that you might want to talk to your doctor about is whether you should um, take uh, anything along with the Revlimid. Uh, sometimes we'll recommend 
like a Valkyrie subcutaneously a couple of times a month or, or maybe even exazomib in a high-risk patient just okay. to reduce the risk of, of early relapse. So maybe just something to talk about with your doctor. If, if uh, the, the, It depends on the details of those chromosome results, but uh, something to think about, okay? I think it was my T, was it T17? I don't remember. I don't have it in front of me. But. Yeah, so if it was the 17P uh, minus, uh, that chromosome 17, uh, please just talk to your doctor and just see, just to draw it to his attention to see if it would be worth to consider enhancing that maintenance in any way, okay? Okay, I appreciate it. Thanks. No worries. All right. And then maybe a final question, and then we're uh, out of time here. Thanks, Doc. Okay, our last question comes from the line of Fennel Siegel. Your line is open. Thank you, Dr. Dury, for another great presentation. Um, I have a question about slide number eight. Yes. Um, the key factors, key factors for progression are two years. Um, yes. I'm, I'm confused in the right-hand column for high-risk smoldering. Right. Um, those those um, bullet points. So does that mean that if we have... 20% of, um, of plasma cells and our free light chain ratio is sitting at 12 right. and our, our M spike is 1.7, right. does that already put us, does that put us in the high risk? I thought that we had to be at 60% or we had to be at 100 for the FLC. Oh, no. Uh, the, the, so, so, so again, this is something to talk to your doctor about, but it sounds as if your numbers are getting close to... Um, the, the the definition for the high risk smoldering and so um, if you look at slide number seven that maybe is a little bit more helpful because it's got the detailed breakdown there where um, it gives you the score the number of points for each of those items that you just mentioned and then you add up the number of points and then it gives you that uh, total score and then I give the summary on nine, on slide number nine to, so I think that my reading of what you just said is that you may be fairly close to that high-risk smoldering where you, you just want to talk to your doctor about what that means for you, okay? So that means that, so that, means that anybody that has got a free light chain ratio from 10 to less than 100 and a serum spike over 1.5 is already starting to push it into the potential high risk. It's where category. you should be looking more closely, yes. absolutely. But, yes. but the numbers okay. are quite important. Uh, these cutoffs are very precise. So as I say, take a look at um, the, the scoring yeah. system and then talk to your doctor in detail. But, it, but certainly uh, yes. it sounds like maybe uh, worth discussing in detail, okay? Okay, thank you, Dr. Dury. All right, thank you for that question. So. Thanks to everyone for your active participation tonight, and so I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Robin for final comments. We really appreciate people being involved with the call today. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Dury, and I'd like to remind our participants that this teleconference tonight is being recorded and can be accessed for replay on the IMF website at myloma.org. And so we also would like to mention that if you have additional questions, don't forget about the IMF info line at 1-800-452-2873. And Missy, Judy, and Paul are happy to take your calls and to help. They're available Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Pacific. And of course, we always thank our sponsors for, for supporting these educational programs. And tonight, we thank Celgene and Takeda Oncology. And once again, thank you, Dr. Dury, and especially all of those on tonight's call. We hope this has helped you to better understand updates in myeloma so you can have good conversations with your myeloma experts at home. So that does conclude this evening's conference call. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful evening. Yes. Thank you all. Have a great evening.